Well, hi, my name is Jamie Hines, and I'm a licensed mental health counselor and addiction counselor. Been in private practice in New Albany, Indiana, and a counselor for 14 years. I have the opportunity to counsel a lot of teenagers and parents, and I am uh, also a mom of three grown children. And I'm not up here because I'm a perfect parent, but I am up here because I'm a passionate mom. And I've been through times of troubles and disappointments, but with the support and encouragement of uh, friends and family and learning lots of things in my practice uh, from great psychologists and psychotherapists, um, I am hoping that I can help offer today some things that would uh, be of benefit to you and equip you with some new things and new thinking. And so um, there are times that I've wanted to go back and raise my kids over with the information that I've learned now. But I want to say, I want to share a, a quote that I like from an American author, Maria Robinson. And it is that nobody can go back and start a new beginning, but anyone can start today and make a new ending. So today we are going to be talking about uh, how to reduce your child's anxiety. And we're going to talk about anxiety um, trends and uh, what causes anxiety and then what you can do as parents to be able to help your child um, to have better coping skills and uh, be able to work through that in a better fashion. So the first thing I'd like to do is to share a little um, brain etiology with you because we're going to refer back to this a lot today. And in the, the base of our brain, this is the first part of the brain to develop and this is our primal survival um, part of our brain and this is where all emotions are this is where fear anger depression we get stuck not motivated and so this is this is the survival part of our brain here and then we have a bridge that comes up here and we have this prefrontal cortex up here this is where we really want to be as much as possible. This is what they call executive functioning. And this is where we have calm, uh, good reasoning, we can regulate our emotion, we have problem solving, uh, planning ahead, self-control, all the things we want for our kids. The, the number one thing is to remember is that these do not work in unison. They do not work at the same time. If we're down here, we can't be up here. So if you think about it, if you're angry, do you use really good uh, reasoning skills and are you calm? No. If you're fearful and anxious, you're going to have irrational thoughts. You're not going to be able to be planning ahead and thinking. So for today, we're going to look at this is survival. When we're, when we're fear based and this is thriving and um, and so I want to share about this pathway a little bit with you and this pathway that goes up here is a um, kind of a slick pathway and um, what happens is every time and I'm going to use the word revved up for today when we get revved up when we get down here uh, this the brain releases a chemical and that chemical is kind of a wash and it washes over this pathway and every time every time every time after a while that smooth area has divots in it and so what happens is when people stay anxious or depressed or angry they get stuck down in this end and that that bridge that pathway becomes rough and uh, doesn't have that smooth transition. So we really don't want to do that. That's, that's not helping our kids or us to stay down here. So we really want to be able to help our kids and ourselves stay up here as much as we can. So that's what I'm going to show you today. A couple things um, about childhood anxiety. Childhood anxiety is on the rise at an alarming rate. And so are anti-anxiety medications. Uh, generalized anxiety is the number one mental health disorder in the U.S. So a couple things I'm going to share today. Let's look at some common causes. Number one, that a mother is a chronic worrier. According to the Journal of American Medical Association, over 80% of children will actually have a generalized anxiety disorder if the mother is a chronic worrier. 
Um, I talk about moms a lot because moms are still primary caretakers, so I'll refer to moms a lot today, but we also want to include dads in that as well. So mom being a chronic worrier is the number one cause for anxiety for children. Number two would be um, if we have an absent parent at home. And that can be physically absent or emotionally absent. So we may have a dad who's working um, 70, 80 hours a week and is not there. That can cause anxiety for children. Or we may have um, a, either parent who's not really emotionally involved and engaged with their kids. They're absent and that can cause some anxiety too. Um, chaotic environment is another uh, factor for childhood anxiety. In fact, that's, that's pretty high on the list as well. So chaotic environment is when the home is not structured, uh, maybe there's alcohol or drug use, uh, al maybe a, um, a lot of anger, mood swings, somebody's not managing their emotions very well, busy schedules where you're coming and going and uh, not, but not able to um, have some downtime and relaxed time and not routine where where a structured environment would be when the kids know when they come home that typically we do homework and we have a snack and they might relax for a little while then dinner will be served and then they have maybe their bedtime routines or some family time you know not structured would be when just it's unpredictable and they don't know what to expect so that would that would keep them down here in an unpredictable area another uh, cause of anxiety would be chronic terminal illness, chronic or terminal illness, and that is when maybe somebody in the family has diabetes or asthma and that child may be wondering um, how, what the outcome is going to be, are they going to have to go to the hospital, are they, is it going to be sick enough that they're going to need, you know, help, are they going to die, so that is often, you know, a cause for childhood anxiety as well. And then the other uh, cause for childhood anxiety that's pretty significant is when we have rigid and flexible parenting. And that is when we have very little negotiating or collaborating in the parent-child relationship. And we're gonna talk more about that a little bit later today. So, a couple things. When childhood anxiety is not dealt with, most likely the, there'll be some degree of adolescent depression and the evidence is that anxious and depressed kids are at risk for use of drugs, alcohol, cutting, suicidal ideation, among many other behavioral issues. So that's why we want to try to help them get relief. And getting relief is getting out of here and being able to be up here. And that's what I'm gonna show you today. So let's look at some current trends. Uh, a couple of trends that we see are rescue parenting, also known as helicopter parenting. And I commonly see this in my practice with parents who are maybe overcompensating after a divorce has happened, they feel bad for their child, and uh, they don't feel like their child should have gone through that for some reason, and maybe their child's not, they don't think their child can cope with the problems on their own, so they come in wanting to fix their child's um, problems, and um, wanting to take care of it for them. But what happens is, by having all good intentions and wanting to do that, when we come in as parents and we try to um, help fix, the child begins to think, I can't do this on my own. I need, I need my parent to do this. And this in turn, decreases the child's confidence that I can't do this. And then they begin to say, they see other peers and other friends maybe not needing their parents as much and well they're doing it then they begin to say well what's wrong with me and why can't I do this which obviously increases their fears of something's wrong with them and then they begin to think you know hey this is not going to get any better I'm not able to do this you know skills are being taught to navigate through and then depression comes and, and uh, so something to remember is that when we have self-reliant confident kids Usually fears are, are lower when, when confidence is higher, but when we have that lower confidence, fears begin to rise. So we really want self-reliant and um, happy, confident kids, as I know as all parents, that's what we want for our kids. So a lot of times um, we think that keeping a child safe helps, um, helps our child, 
but really that what we find is that's a way for parents that have, a, that have a lot of anxiety, that's how they manage their own. If I, if I keep things safe out there, then I can relax and I realize that that helps me feel uh, things are good. So um, by keeping safe sometimes, what that would look like is, I don't, I don't want you to go out and do that with so-and-so and I don't want you to do that. And, and a perfect example of that is if you, if you had a set of parents and they were to say, uh, and, and the child would say, uh, Dad, uh, what kind of ca car would you like me to have? And the dad might say, well, I want you to have a truck. I want you to have something that's got a big engine or, you know, whatever it is. What do you think the mom would say? She would say, a safe one. <laughs> Most moms, we would say her first response would be, I want you to be in a safe, in a safe one, okay? So let's look at what we can do to help. We actually want kids to learn the skills at home so they can be able to navigate through adversities that they face on their own that they're gonna have in life as adults. We want them to be prepared with how to deal with obstinate people, uh, difficult situations. So when we can help them learn, get up here and learn those good problem, problem solving skills and how to cope in a more effective way using the top part of their brain, um, then what we wanna do is be able to help them get to that at a, at a better, um, at a better direction so that they don't stay down here feeling like they can't cope and they can't do it. And the more they say, I can't do it, I can't do it, we know that's not gonna help them get up here. So I'm gonna give you some tools today to help you do that. Another thing I wanna share is, the more that we stay down here, the more that we stay down here, okay? If we get revved up and revved up and revved up, like I say, this, this, doesn't, this gets washed away. So keep in mind, if this is a muscle, and if it's not used, it, we lose it. So we, don't, we wanna be able to help them get up here as much as possible. So in dealing with fears and anxiousness, we want them to be exposed to situations, okay? And you're thinking, oh, that doesn't feel safe. But when they can be exposed to situations, they can understand that that's simply just some uncomfortableness, okay? Uncomfortable feelings, uncomfortable thinking that they may have doesn't really mean things are true. Just because I have that feeling doesn't mean it's really, it's really accurate. Just because I have a thought, I mean thoughts come in and thoughts leave. We, we, we have thoughts, uh, thousands of thoughts a day and if we, they don't all come true. They're just simply thoughts. So we want to just call them for what they are. Uh, that we know that every thought we have can't be true. So we want to help them distinguish that a feeling, what I say is feelings are like clouds. They come and they go, okay? And we want to be able to help them know just because they're feeling uncomfortable about something doesn't mean they're going to stay that way. We can help them learn how to work through those emotions, okay? Um, so, uh, uh, one thing I want to share about today is give you an example. I'm going to use Johnny as an example. So let's. I'm going to give a typical example of what, how parents might handle something and then I'm going to help you look at maybe a better way to have less anxiousness and anger. So we'll give an example about Johnny uh, and Johnny is, uh, loves video games and he's, he's, I'll say he's on the borderline of obsessed with video games and so he gets up early, early on, um, on a Sunday morning uh, before, he, before he would go to church, he gets up early and he uh, takes a shower, eats everything he does, and so he wants to have hours to play his video game before his parents and, and he, he goes on for the day. But his parents changed their mind and they came in the morning when Johnny's playing his game and said, hey Johnny, we're actually going to go, Lee, we're going to leave a little early this morning. And he has a big meltdown, blow up, that you said we were going to do this, now we're going to do this. And so what do parents typically do is they say, oh, okay, and maybe they go ahead that day and do that. But then the next time they say, you know what, let's don't change our plans because we know what happens to Johnny when we change plans. So what they do is they're not exposing Johnny to that. They're keeping him from learning the opportunity of how to work, how to work through something. When Johnny has meltdowns or blowups, he's down here but he can learn to be up here. All right, so let's look at a couple ways. Let's say that um, mom, mom and dad come in or someone comes in and says, Johnny, we are going to be going, um, leaving early today. 
and he has a meltdown or blow up. So we say, hey, Johnny, you know what? It's okay that you're, that you're upset right now. Let's find a way for you to, to calm down. Let's go do something. Um, and then, they, so they connect with him and how he feels. Uh, recognize that he's upset, that things aren't going the way he wants them to. And then they, so he maybe say, Johnny, let's find something you can do to help yourself calm down. Then a little later, they can come back to Johnny when he's calm and maybe later in that afternoon and say, Johnny, listen, remember earlier today when you got so upset, it's okay to be upset when things don't always go our way, but it's not okay and it's not good to have blow ups or meltdowns. Let's find, I know you have good problem solving skills up there, Johnny, so let's find a way that we can make this work for both of us, okay? Um, so maybe we could say to Johnny, what do you think um, would be a way that you could still get your video time in today, your video games in today, but that we can go and, and do some things earlier that we wanted to do? And so let, make him use his brain. Let him come up with examples of what would help him the most. And that's something that I think is good. We want, if they're down here, what can we do? We want to connect with them. We want to connect with them and say, hey, I understand you're upset right now. Validate that feeling. But we also want to be able to say, what would help you the most right now, Johnny? And he might say that we don't go, that I could stay and play this video game. And you could say, well, that would work for you, but that doesn't really work for us. Let's come up with something else. And he might say, how about when I, we come right back, I could eat my lunch up here. And we don't, maybe we don't go out to eat as a family today. Maybe we can come back and, and we could do that. And that might work for both of you. So let them come up with some problem solving things on their own because then when it's their idea, they'll buy into it more, okay? So that's just an example there. Um, we always wanna normalize anxiety. When we resist it, and a lot of parents would come into this situation and say, Johnny, absolutely, stop what you're doing, da 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 da, and they would try to redirect that behavior the parents are getting revved up, <laughs> they're, they're here now, and Johnny's here now. So that's not really gonna work. You've got to remember, you're the parent, and as much as you can stay up here, then you'll be able to have those calm reasoning and problem solving skills to be able to help your son or daughter to get up here too. So we have to learn how to manage our anxiety and our anger and our emotions so that we can help our kids uh, and be a good example of how they can get up here as well. So we always want to normalize anxiety or depression. We want to call it for what it is. We want to be able to identify that feeling we don't want to push them through it. And an example would say, uh, let's say that a family dog chewed up an assignment for your daughter. She had a project that was due, she left it out, and the dog chewed it up. Well, she's furious, and she says she doesn't want the dog anymore. She's so mad at the dog. You can come in and validate by saying, you know, if it were my assignment and the dog chewed it up, I could see myself being upset too. There's the connection you made. Normalizes her feelings. Hey, you know what? If I were in your shoes and I put all that work into that project, I would be upset too. So don't worry about coming in and saying, well, you shouldn't have left the paper out or you should have done this or you should have done that. We're trying to redirect first there, which keeps you here and them here. So come back and say, hey, you know what? If I were in your shoes and that happened to me, I could, I could see myself being upset about that too. Uh, then you can come back and say, you know, this is a good opportunity, I think, for parents to let them know, hey, you know what, you know how you were really upset about what happened with the dog earlier, and I understand that, but I want you to think about what happened last week when you and Jessica and so-and-so were outside playing and um, Speckles, the dog, was chasing you all around and you all were having so much fun. Uh, you can see that she, her feelings were different about the dog then than they are now and how feelings can change. We don't want kids to think that I, this is, this is what it is. This is, I feel this way and I'm never going to get out of it. Sometimes they get caught in that, that feelings, we can simply move through them and that, and, and we can give them good ways to move through that as well. So 
you know, she didn't want the dog to be gone um, last week when she was playing with her friends outside. That was fun. But right now she's, she's upset with that dog, okay? And so when she's, not, when she's not upset and she calms down, then you can go back and try to redirect and help her use her problem solving skills up here. You can come back and say, hey, I know that um, you really want to make a good grade on this project and I want you to make a good grade on this project too. So let's come up with some ideas that would help you be able to, uh, and some options to be able to what we could do, what you could do with this project. And she might say, well, I could, um, I could go ahead and start redoing it and um, or see if there's any way to uh, fix, the, the, fix with the project or be able to do that. I could, I could talk to my teacher and let her know what happened and maybe ask for a, another, another day delayed, uh, maybe without a penalization for the grade. Um, I could, but you, you let her come up with the ideas. And, and a, a way that I respond, if I don't really think it's a good response or I don't think it's a good thought, I would simply just say, well, that's a thought. <laughs> so you can respond. We don't want to negate and say, no, that wouldn't work. No, that wouldn't work. We let her get in there and come up with as many problem solving ideas. And what will happen is she'll come up with her own solution more than likely. And she'll feel good that she was the one that was be able to, to do the problem solving versus what, what a lot of times I see is that parents would come in and say, okay, your project's due tomorrow. Okay, what do we need to do? And so we're, moms or dads are rubbed up down here. All right, I'll run to the store and I'll get a new thing and I'll help you with this and we'll do this and we'll do this and we'll get it taken care of. And they come in and they rescue and they take care of it. And then she's, well, she gets robbed of being able to come up here and use her own problem solving skills of coming up with it. And we know that's what she'll need when we're not around. She'll need to come up with some things on her own um, to be able to do that. So I think it's a, it's a really good thing uh, for um, uh, in relationships too. We see this a lot. I have a lot of um, boys and girls who come in and maybe they're being bullied at school or something's going on and, and of course as a parent we have that urge to want to get in there and come in and talk to the school counselor and say we've got to do something so and so needs that um, and, and hear me out if it's if it's somebody's being threatened then you know we need to maybe step in there and, and help out but typically it's just going to be some uncomfortable feelings your kids are dealing with and we want to help them be able to get up here in this part of their brain and come up with some problem solving solutions themselves and say hey what do you think would be helpful. Let's look at some ways we can come up with that this would work for you and, um, and, and, and help them and st help them stimulate and, and be able to get up here and come up with some ideas that they think might work. And they might need a little prodding. They might need a, a little bit of, you could say, hey, do you think this might work, you know? And, and maybe and let them play on that and, and, and interact and, and negotiate. So your job as a parent is to help maybe get, let them start and you can, you can give some help in that for sure. But we want to be able to help them problem solve is, is, the, is the ultimate thing, okay? So remember, we don't want to stay in this limbic system. We always want to try to get up here as often as we can, okay? So I, one thing I do is uh, come up to kids and I'll say, hey, I know you're a really good problem solver and I could use your help today in something. And I might give a situation um, uh, that I, or even make one up that I'm dealing with and I'll have that child help me in that. And then I'll say, hey, you know what? You, that was great, and I'm wondering if you could maybe use that in your situation today, okay? And they have this aha moment, like, hey, I never thought about that, okay? So you could say, hey, you know, what do, what do you think is, uh, you know, maybe you could share even a time that something happened with you and a friend and maybe how you wish you to handle it differently. We, sure, we can share that. I think that's wonderful to, to do with our kids. But we don't want to go in there and say, well, you need to go in there and talk to so-and-so. You need to go do this. You need to go do that. Because what we're doing there is robbing them the opportunity to do that. Okay? So let's, let's, let's go into a different, um, little different avenue. I know that parents struggle a lot about getting their kids to do chores. And this same, same thing here. So I'm going to give an example of um, Johnny, I'm just going to use Johnny again. And let's look at um, Johnny's chore is to take the trash out on Sunday night. And 
you all have been to grandma's uh, on Sunday to eat and get home a little later than normal and Johnny is jumping out of the car and getting ready to go in because his favorite TV show is on and he doesn't want to miss it but in your mind you're thinking uh 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 the trash needs to be taken out and so what you can do um, let's look at some different pathways some different possibilities and we're going to start with pathway A and that's the rigid inflexible parenting that I talked about earlier and that would be Johnny no you can't go in and turn your TV show on you have got your responsibilities are to get the trash out and it's Sunday night and that's what you got to do and what's going to happen to Johnny right then is he's probably going to be revved up and he's going to say but my show's on you usually said I can watch my show and so he's going to get revved up down here and then more than likely you're going to get revved up and everybody's going to stay revved up and nobody's going to get up here so let's jump down to pathway C and that would be Johnny you have taken the trash out consistently all summer long and you've not missed one time and you know what I want you to be able to watch your show tonight and I realize we came home later from grandma's and didn't give you enough time to do that so tonight I'll go ahead and take out the trash for you or dad and I'll do that and you go ahead and watch your show and we got it covered for you tonight and that is absolutely okay to do once in a while to give them a break you know hard work deserves reward and uh, when kids are, are showing behaviors and responsibility, we do want to reward them. So that would be okay once in a while. But we don't want to let Johnny out of his chores all the time because that wouldn't promote good, responsible, self-reliant behavior. So let's look at pathway B. And that is, well, remember our, what our goal is, is to keep from being down here, is when Johnny gets ready to jump out of the car and wants to go watch his show, that you can say, hey, Johnny, I need your help with something. I know your show's on, and I really want you to watch that show too. Um, that's connecting with him. And you say, you know, but the trash is your responsibility, and we really want you to get the trash out. Can you help come up with something that this will work for both of us, that you get to watch your show and the trash comes out? And what's going to happen then? You, you know, you tell him he's a good problem solver and you need his help in something, more than likely he's going to want to because he's hearing that you want him to watch his show. So you could say, help me with a couple ideas that would work. And maybe he might say, well, I'll do it after, I'll do it after the show, okay? Well, you say, that's a thought <laughs> because after the show you think he needs to brush his teeth and get his pajamas on and go to bed and that's going to make him later. So you say, well, that's, that's an idea or that's a thought and that would work for you, but that really wouldn't work as best for me, so help us come up with another one. And then he might say, how about commercial? Um, and you can say, well, okay, um, that's an idea, and how many commercials are in the show that you watch? Maybe three or four commercials. And he says, okay, you could say, what would you be willing to do the first commercial? Let him come up and get up here. He might say, well, I can get all the downstairs basement trash collected. And you can even say, you know what? and we could get the, the top floor collected for you to help you out a little bit. Navigating and collaborating, it's going on. And then um, he might say, well, um, and then I'll take it out maybe on the last commercial. And you can say, hey, you know what? I'm wondering if um, maybe one of those commercials, would you be willing to get your teeth brushed and your jammies on so that um, when the show is over, you'd be able to go to bed? And so what, what we want is, nobody's really getting revved up and upset here we're looking at possibilities and what we can do to make this work for both and hey I'm gonna I'm gonna be able to get to watch my show and the parents like hey and he's gonna take responsibility and get the trash out so I think that's that's a way that we can we can do that as well so um, really want to bottom line is is to help our kids be able to problem solve on their own so they don't stay anxious, they don't stay revved up, they're not angry, they don't stay locked into here because we know that's not where they want to be um, and we don't want them to be there. And um, so I think it's really important um, just to remember those things that you're, you both really want the same thing and we don't want to do things that sabotage and keep our kids down here. We, our intent is the best, but sometimes what we're doing can take away from what we really want. So I hope you found today's um, session helpful. 
And something I want to share is this is what brought me about with Operation Parent, what drew me to Operation Parent. It's an organization whose mission is to provide ongoing education, support, and hope to those who are raising teens and preteens in today's culture. And uh, there's lots of opportunity and lots of resources and uh, things that you can get that will help encourage you and equip you and that you're not alone in raising teenagers and that we can share ideas with one another and help because it does take a village to raise our kids.